Welcome back to my Unreal Engine C++ tutorial series. In this video, we'll be covering the Unreal Build Tools, Default Modes, Input, and Locomotion. It's important to understand how all the fundamentals work in Unreal Engine, so if you find yourself confused in this video, try watching it again or research the topics until you understand everything that is going on. Unreal Engine C++ developers adhere to coding conventions, so if we head over to the actor.h file, we can see that enumerators have the prefix e, and actors have the prefix a. Everything else will have the prefix u, denoting that it is a child of u object. The only other exception to this are structs, and structs should have the prefix of f. So if we look here at references, Every single actor component has the prefix u. And if we look at f vector, we can see it has the prefix of f. You may have also noticed that Unreal C++ uses Pascal case, which means the first letter of every word in a symbol is capitalized, excluding booleans, which are prefixed with the letter b. One thing that was not covered in the previous video is the concept of memory management and garbage collection. Every child of U object is automatically memory managed by Unreal's garbage collector. If we head over to Unreal Engine's community wiki, we can see that garbage collection tracks U objects and its subclasses, which include actor and U actor component, which means we never have to use the keyword new and we never have to use the keyword delete. The exception to this is if you create a class whose parent is not derived from U object in some way. If something is marked U property, it means it is no longer going to be garbage collected. This is important for later. Unreal Engine projects are comprised of something called modules, and every module is defined by a build file, .build.cs. As we can see here, my project is inheriting module rules. And if we take a look at the Unreal Engine source, all of these are modules and each one of them has a build file that is a child of module rules. And if we look here, we can see that our module depends on core, core uobject, engine, and input core modules. Every module needs a module implementation file and a macro to implement the module. The module class here, the default one, is a child of iModule interface. If we head over to a different module, such as input core, we can see that this module class, f input core module, also inherits from my module interface. The last thing to cover in the build system is target files. Each target.cs file declares a class deriving from the target rules base class. Target files determine how you want to actually build your binaries. You can use target files to create a game, editor, client, server, or program. If you ever try booting up your project and it says that you cannot build from the editor and you need to build from source, there's a solution to that through Sublime Text build systems. If you see here, we can use shell CMD in a build system to build the engine from a terminal. If you want to create a new build system, go to Tools New Build System and pass in the file path to your build shell script. Then the name of your target file, your platform, Linux would be Win64 if you're on Windows. Development is the configuration, and then a path to your uProject file. Then after that, select the build and hit Control B to build from Sublime Text. Just as a side note, this will be a .batch file in the Windows folder instead on Windows. We need a game mode to hold our player class, so let's create a new blueprint game mode, which is a child of game mode base. Name it and assign it to your project's default game mode under project settings. If we want to create something that we can possess and move around the game world with, we need to create a character. Characters are pawns that have mesh collision and built-in movement logic. In pawns, is the base class of all actors that can be possessed by players or AI. Go ahead and go into Unreal Engine, create a new character class, name it whatever you'd like and put it in the private folder.
As we can see here, they've added a bunch of default functions for us, commented. You can keep the comments here if you'd like. In order to code an input into our character using enhanced input, we need to add a reference to our build file to the module enhanced input. And while we're here, let's go ahead and add in a couple lines to define the private and public include paths of our module. This is so that when we use the include preprocessor statement, we don't have to specify our project name directory every single time. We're going to have to override pong client restart in our character class in order to properly register our mapping context and enhanced input. Under our setup player input component method, let's cast our input component into a enhanced input component and ensure that this casts correctly by enclosing it in an if statement. Now our compiler has no idea what an enhanced input component is at this moment, so let's go ahead and add in the includes for enhanced input one being the enhanced input component, the other being the enhanced input subsystem. We need to add in our engine plugin folder in order to have access to enhanced input in our Sublime project. And now if we control P, we can see that enhanced input is registered in our Sublime text project. We can navigate to enhanced input component see that that is the header file that we are going to need. Next up we need to add two new assets, one being a mapping context and the other being an input action. Let's go ahead and create both of those and name them however you see fit. We're going to need to define our value in our input action as an axis 2D since moving around is going to be on a two-dimensional plane. Under our mapping context let's set our input action and give it four keys W, A, S, and D. We're going to need to add modifiers to these in order to pass the correct value into our enhanced input system. For S, we need to navigate in the opposite direction, so let's negate it. For A, we need to act on the Y axis and move in the opposite direction. So let's swizzle input axis to Y and negate the value. And for D, we need to just act in the positive direction on the y-axis, so only a swizzle. Let's add a new blueprint class that is a child of our C++ player class that we created, just for easy modification. Let's also create a platform for our player to move around in and throw in a player start. The platform I'm using a world grid material and a shrunken down cube. In order to get our player class to interact with our input assets, we need to create two new declarations in our header file flagged with U property. So if we head over to the header file, we can define two new public variables in our header file marked with U property and edit defaults only. One of type input action and one of type input mapping context. Flagging a variable as U property allows you to assign many different property specifiers to the object. These can do a wide variety of things, such as make the object editable within the editor, visible within the editor, we can make it readable by blueprints, and so forth. Since our compiler doesn't know what input actions are, in mapping context, we can add forward declarations to avoid having to include entire header files. Let's compile, and in the blueprint, we should be able to assign our mapping context and input action. 
Now our character class has direct references to our input assets. In order to assign functionality into our input action, we need to bind an action to our player input component. Let's do a null check and then call bind action off our player enhanced input component. Bind action takes four arguments, the action and enumeration of type e trigger event, world context object, and a function pointer to be called whenever the key is pressed. The enumeration of e trigger event we're going to be using triggered because we want our function to be called every tick when our key is pressed. We now need to define our function move. And if we're wondering what parameters this takes, it's actually variable. If we head over to the docs, we can see we can use f input action value, f input action instance for this last one, which takes in three parameters. For this, we'll use the first one. This will give us access to the axis 2D value in our input action, our x and y. We need to add the header file and then create the implementation. While we're at it, let's go ahead and register our mapping context. So let's get a reference to our enhanced input local player subsystem. Next, we want to clear all of our current mapping contexts and then add in our mapping context. Now for our move function, we want to simultaneously add movement input for both our X and Y. This way we can strafe by pressing A and W at the same time, for instance. Action value with the index operator of zero will access X, with one will access Y. Now let's come over to our blueprint game mode class and assign the default pawn class to our blueprint character. And then once we do that, we should be able to play and move around. Thank you for watching. I know that tutorial was kind of all over the place, but I guess that's what I get for trying to cram three gigantic topics into 15 minutes. Before watching the next video, I recommend you try and implement jumping and looking around with your mouse on your own. It's using the same types of processes that we covered in this video, and I'm sure you can do it. Next video, we'll be covering UI, items, and a basic interact system. If you enjoyed the video, remember to like, comment, subscribe. If you dislike it, dislike it, and I'll see you in the next one.